suicide here at the high school. I can talk for 16 to 18 hours, so I'm not really, I'm not positive. Yeah, I know you did. <laughs> do you get to stand the whole time? Yes, I do. going to get started here. Uh, I'm just going to introduce myself. I'm Dr. Troy Sparrow. Most of you that are here uh, know me uh, or of me. And I'm going to be speaking today about uh, memory, uh, brain health, and uh, introduce some of the programs that exist out there. And uh, we are uh, live on YouTube. This will be up on our website for future reference, number one. And I know we have people um, watching from Canada and from Mexico and a few other places around the country, so I welcome them. Uh, this is a topic that I could legitimately speak an entire week on because of how much information there is. So what I did was, I, like I always do with these uh, types of talks, is I put all the information I have, gather it, and then I start to whittle it down. And I got it down to about a two hour presentation, but when it started it was well over 60 hours. So that tells you a lot of stuff. Number one, there's a lot of information about it. Um, number two, there's a lot of demand for information about it. So we're going to go through some of the basics. Uh, and I'm just going to start with this uh, statement. The reason why so many people are looking for information about our brain health and memory is because they know someone who's gone through issues or they're going through it themselves. So that should hit home. When you see some of the statistics, it's going to bring home even a little bit more. But I want you to really hear this. Alzheimer's and memory loss is preventable. And we're going to go through some of the basics with that and even give you some tools to start no matter what stage you're at. Okay? And so uh, let's just start with uh, the big question. And uh, how does the brain work and memory work, right? So in a simple two-hour talk, we're going to talk about how the brain works. I'm going to summarize. I have 12 years of post-grad, uh, post-education graduate work um, in fields of microbiology and neurology, functional neurology. And so I'm going to be speaking from a very functional um, perspective. So there's a lot of, I try not to put a lot of the hard science in here. It does exist. We have it. We'll be going through it. Um, so I put references, but I'm trying to make it so that um, it's applicable. So uh, at the end, we'll be talking as you here answering questions and anything like that. But when we first start, I just want you to get the foundational stuff because you guys would be surprised how a lot of our daily routine influences our memory, good or bad. And so there's a lot of things you can do in your daily walk that can just improve your memory. So how does the brain work? 
So I first wrote about this in my book 22 years ago now, which sounds crazy. But 22 years ago, I spoke about how the nerves communicate. So I, I want you guys just to take a look at this. And uh, there's a couple things I want you to just take note of. Number one, there's electric currents firing through your nerves all the time. Number two, what's something you notice that's kind of weird when you look at this? What does it look like? Anyone? Go ahead and share any thoughts. Spider web? Spider web, yep. Yeah. Like an explosion. But like an explosion? Yeah, and that's, there's basically nerves firing electrical signals from one place to the other. It does look like a spider web. It's all intertangled. That's how it communicates. That's how it transfers all that information. So it's got, they've got to be really close to each other, number one. Number two, also look at how much space is in between our nerves. There's a lot of space there, and so pay attention to that because that's important when it comes to memory. Number one, those signals that are going through, and number two, how much space in between the cells. But they, they all intertangle like that for good communication, and that's really what, how the brain works. So this is the formula for the general formula for how the brain works. In order for the brain to survive, S equals survive, the brain must be activated and it needs fuel supply. So that is, that's 12 years of neurology in one statement, okay? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk you through that. I could do an entire eight hours just on this one formula. S equals A plus F. For your nerves to survive, you need to activate that nerve. So how do you activate the nerve? any one of your senses. Anything that has a receptor in our body, it receives information and then sends a signal, like you saw that electrical signal, through the nerves, that nerve got activated. So that firing of the electric signal. So when you smell something, you just activated a nerve. When you see something, that activates a nerve, your optic nerve. When you taste something, it activates your nerve. When you touch something, it activates a nerve. The tricky one is these receptors called muscle spindles. They're in our muscles. When you move, it activates a nerve. So kinesthetic movement is one of our biggest activators. One of the, one of the things I share often is to prove that point is you take someone who's very, very healthy, like an astronaut, and they send them into space. How long can they stay in space before they have to return to Earth? Take a guess, wild guess. So a really good guess, actually. Two years is the, is the longest people can stay in space before returning to Earth because they get so physically weak and they get cognitive decline. Uh -huh. They start to get cognitive decline, dementia-type scenarios, because there's no gravity in space. Without that gravity, you lose the feedback from your muscles to the brain. So just by losing that one major signaling system, you start to get mental decline. And they're very physically weak because you don't have to use your muscles. You literally can push and float forever, right? So no gravity, so they have to return, they have to, return to Earth. So, that's, so then when we look at keeping the brain alive, what does that tell you here on Earth? Let's say we're staying on Earth, and no one here is gonna be an astronaut. What does that tell you? Movement is really important. Using your muscles for brain health. It's one of the key, if not the key, activators of our brain. So we have to physically move to keep our brain going. Right? So all of our other senses too, taste, touch, smell, our thoughts. We're meant to guard our thoughts, why? Because they can have good or negative outcomes. They activate our brain. So physical activation, all of our sensory cells activate. So that's the activation part. But just like if you're gonna turn the car on to actually drive somewhere, what does it need? Gas in the tank, that's right. You gotta have fuel. What is the number one fuel that you need for your brain? I know you're thinking, Troy, we're here to listen to you. Why are you asking us the questions? Water. Water's good. Yeah. What's that? Glucose. Glucose is good, that's number two. I'll give you, I'll give you an idea. You only live 10 minutes without this. Oxygen, nailed it. <laughs> I know, right? It's a, after the fact, you're like, oh, I should've got that one. So we need oxygen. Oxygen is first and foremost what we need. Without oxygen, without air, the brain doesn't do much after a while. 
and then it's glucose, because that's how we create energy in the brain. The brain is more metabolically active than any other organ in the body. So we need oxygen and sugar. I'm going to say proper sugar. Because the problem is with diabetics is they've lost the ability to deliver sugar properly to the brain, to their nerves. And that's why you see a lot of the neuropathies and the other problems in the body is because they've lost the ability to properly deliver sugar. So we need sugar in balance. And then you have all the other things in the, in the fuel that help, all your B vitamins and minerals. Those things help use oxygen and sugar for energy. So in five minutes, that's how the brain works. We need to properly activate our brain by activating our senses, and we need fuel supply, balanced oxygen and sugar. What happens if your sugar gets too low? Does that affect you mentally? Yes, they even make Snickers commercials about it. You're not quite acting yourself. Here, here's a Snickers. That's not the solution to good brain health. I'm just gonna say that. They're creating their own problem. It's brilliant marketing, but if you continually eat high glycemic foods like candy bars, it actually will cause your sugar to go up and then spike down. But that'll affect your mood. That'll affect all kinds of things in the moment as far as sleep. And uh, we see that continually. As you get worse at managing your blood sugar, it affects overall brain health. And we're going to get a little deeper into the types of more serious uh, dementia and Alzheimer's down the road. But it's very important to know that sugar is the number one thing, in my opinion, this is my personal opinion, the number one thing in North America, and, and probably the world, but the first world countries for sure, that is in excess that affects your memory. And it doesn't do it right away. Because when you're kids, you give kids a bunch of refined sugar, what happens to them? Yeah, they go crazy, bouncing off the walls, and they've actually got tons of energy. But after doing that for 30 years, what happens? The exact opposite. And so it's very, very important early on. And I, I like to say this one statement. In the early 1900s, the average American consumed five pounds of sugar a year. In 2010, take a guess what the average American consumed based off of just supplies. 160 pounds. That is a full human being worth, worth of sugar. A hundred years earlier, five pounds. They've got sugar in our schools with our kids right now. They're, they have more sugar than they have um, nutrients and good foods and stuff. We're doing the exact opposite of what's needed for our brains. So S equals A plus F. So now, if someone says to you, how does the brain work, what have you got? Really nothing, I know, it's S equals A plus F, but <laughs> what they're gonna say, what, can you explain that to me? But but think about this for a second. Deep breathing exercises, exercise, aerobic exercise, movement, these are real basic things we can do and they help our brain. Now, if it's gotten to a certain point already, there's much, much more you have to do. But to help prevent with our kids, what's important? Just two things. Keep them moving, exercising, and sugar, diet, yes. Those two things can help quite a bit. So. Communication is the key to success. The reason why I named the clinic Synapse is because it's the junction where communication occurs, where two nerves come together, it's called a synapse. So the key to health is proper communication. Everything has a mental, chemical, physical, or spiritual component to it. Proper communication, when there's a breakdown of communication, that leads to dysfunction. Dysfunction eventually leads to disease. So is it important for us to stay communicating? Yes. The way this really hits home for all the people uh, who are married or have spouses is if there's a breakdown in communication, gentlemen, does that lead to dysfunction in the relationship? The answer is yes. <laughs> so good communication is the same in the body. So these are different things. These are the top 10 that can actually cause a breakdown in communication. And I really want you to see these top 10. If you get on these top 10 right now, you're going to be improving the synaptic communication of those nerves, number one, and actually preventing cognitive decline, which is the main reason why people are tuning into this type of lecture and talk. So I'm going to go through a few of them here. Number one, stress and poor sleep. They go together. So poor sleep is a different form of stress. If we don't get into deep restorative sleep, 
that causes a lot of problems that are already on this list. Inflammation, the inability to actually uh, digest your food properly. We see a, a whole bunch of uh, dysfunction internally from poor sleep. It affects our mood, it affects our ability to actually perform in life. Now what happens when you have stress? What do you crave? Sugar and salt is exactly right. And sugar, we just spoke about, is the number one fuel source, number two fuel source for the brain. So over time, chronic stress becomes a real significant challenge and problem. Again, this is a lifestyle thing for most people. But also poor sleep. Uh, many people don't know, but there's 102 diagnosable sleep disorders by Stanford University. They're considered one of the top universities in sleep in the world. 102 diagnosable sleep disorders. And people really know about five or six whenever I do these talks, they can come up with five or six. The reason why we know those five or six in the United States is because those are the only five or six where the insurance companies cover something for them, like sleep apnea, they cover the CPAP. But there are a lot of other sleep disorders. And so just focusing on your sleep hygiene is really important. And if you identify a problem, keep working on it until you, you get to a solution. You should wake up feeling rested. You should not need a nap. Now, I'm gonna say this with a caveat. If you have young kids and a baby at home, completely different category, we're not talking about that. But if you're able to sleep, you should wake up feeling rested, not need a nap the next day, and remember that you dream, that you dreamt. You, didn't, you don't have to exactly remember all the details of your dream, but you should know that you're at least dreaming. Those three things uh, are very important. Also, so if, if they're not working, then you know that you're not getting the quality restorative sleep that you need. One other weird uh, scenario uh, is that if you happen to gain fat around your kneecaps, it's one of those hidden little signs of a sleep disorder. So I like to throw that gem out there, yeah? And so, uh, very, very important now, everyone's checking their kneecaps. <laughs> All right, so the second one is inflammation. We've heard this word a lot, but there's a lot of foods that cause inflammation. There's a lot of different things in our environment that cause inflammation. It's also things like nutritional deficiencies, like omega-3 deficiencies, that um, if you don't have enough of the anti-inflammatories in your body. So again, that's a whole other uh, lecture. Now I put here communication disruptors, anemia. So a lot of people forget that anemia really is a lack of oxygen. Anemia is having low blood hemoglobin or blood markers that deliver oxygen to your cells. So when someone has anemia, the reason why they feel as bad as they do is because you're not getting oxygen to the cells. And, it, and that affects the brain like we just spoke about, but many other things. Blood sugar imbalances we spoke about, food reactions, food intolerances, food allergies, and food sensitivities all can dis, uh, cause problems with communication. There's a scenario too with leaky gut and food reactions that sets up a sleep disorder. So have you ever heard of how the gut is the second brain? You guys heard that one? Some, yeah. So there's a second brain because it affects a lot of the neurotransmitters and affects our brain quite a bit. So food reactions, it doesn't have to be an allergy like an anaphylactic peanut allergy. It could be something that you just don't digest properly and co it causes a reaction in the gut. So it's important to know what foods work for you and what foods don't. Some foods will constipate you. And constipation, basically, we've heard the saying, you are what you eat. The real saying is, we, you are what you don't eliminate. So if you are not getting rid of the toxic waste out of the bowels and you're reabsorbing some of that, you're just polluting your body again instead of getting rid of it. So constipation is something that uh, has to be addressed right away. And I know this talk isn't about that, but the, the 30 second version of what to do with constipation, increase your water, increase your magnesium, and start increasing fiber slowly in some way, shape, or form, and fix the sleep uh, disorder. So that's the quick 30 second version. And I apologize, some of this might be from, like drinking from a fire hose with some of the information, some of it you've probably heard a lot of, but there's so much here that I encourage you to kind of come back to it, and um, there's a, a lot more depth to it that we can, and breadth that we can go into. Toxins, environmental toxins, uh, are very, very crucial as far as uh, disrupting your uh, communication process. Anything like a, a heavy metal, like mercury or lead, it can conduct 
a current. Now, what do you what do you see down here? Electric currents. So, has anyone heard that things like lead uh, and aluminum have affected memory? Uh, there's different studies that have come up over the years. Well, this is why. If you put any type of metal near an electric wire, it's going to conduct that current, and they can even fry some of the whatever's touching it, whatever's close to it. Same thing happens in our body. Not only that, toxins and metals basically compromise our ability to, it compromises the environment. So it'll change the pH of a soil in a garden. You let a, tr a truck kind of disintegrate the metals and the, all of the, the chemicals will pollute that garden and then the food becomes something you shouldn't eat. Hmm. Well, same thing internally. If we're full of metals and pollutants and, and things from um, that are man-made really that we've come up with, they, they may not work very well uh, in our body. So, what's the definition of a toxin? My definition of a toxin is basically anything your body doesn't know how to use. Mm -hmm. If it's not innately something from our food supply that God made, then it probably isn't something your body knows how to use very well. A lot of our problems come from chemicals that mimic natural substances. Like uh, a lot of the uh, chemicals that come from 3M's been getting a lot of, uh, getting in trouble with a lot of their stuff. Uh, I have a lot of friends at 3M, so this is nothing against them. But they, some of the chemicals become what we call endocrine disruptors. They mimic estrogen, but they're not like estrogen. They look like estrogens. They bind to the receptors of estrogen, but they don't do the function estrogen is supposed to. So it disrupts their endocrine system or their hormone system. So toxins become a very, very, um, key disruptor of how our body and brain works. And I was doing a, a lecture, uh, oh boy, it must have been 14 years ago, and I was down at uh, Duke University and uh, speaking about, at that time, it was um, 74,000 different chemicals that the FDA has not even been, been able to assess. And it's 11,000 every year, new ones, that get added into our system. Mm -hmm. And so everyone thinks that we have a good handle on all of these things are progressing. It's out of control. We're not even looking at it. One of the scientists came up to me afterwards and said, love your presentation, but I need to talk to you about your numbers. And I thought, oh boy, here we go. Um, but he said, we actually track the number of chemicals. And he said, it's well over 84,000 at that point versus the 74,000 that I was referencing. But in the literature at the time, that's what it was. And now it's well over 100,000 different chemicals that we don't have any idea what they do to our body haven't been able to assess them. And we sometimes they jump the line when you see something that's drastically inducing cancers and stuff like that. Um, but we find that out by, I mean, we're the filters. We're the guinea pigs, basically. So that's a, that is a big disruptor of a lot of communication. That's why you see certain things come off the market or become illegal at some point. Uh, infections and bacterial imbalance called dysbiosis, hormone imbalances, nutritional deficiencies, and then the last one, sedentary lifestyle. Remember the astronaut story? Mm -hmm. Sedentary lifestyle, mental and physical, if you're not using your brain, if you're not using your body, if you're sedentary in both, then we just see a decline in communication. In fact, sedentary lifestyle is now considered in healthcare the new smoking. So for 30 years they asked, are you a smoker? Why? because that increased your risk of degenerative disease, cancers, heart disease, mental decline, all these different things. Now they ask about your activity level because it has overtaken smoking as the number one contributor to these problems. So the quick way of saying it, sedentary lifestyle is the new smoking. Wow. Yeah, that is a wow. Most, a lot of people are, are at home being entertained by their phones, their computers, their TVs, and we need to get up and moving. So just that one alone can help with uh, a lot of vitality for body and brain. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about what people are most concerned about with, with their memory. Cognitively unimpaired is basically, this comes from the Alzheimer's Association, then it goes to mild cognitive impairment. So when you are in these two categories right here, there's a ton we can do to prevent these other categories. Mild cognitive impairment in particular, mild dementia, uh, we'll even talk about what can be done to help that. And just so everyone knows, when I get into it a little bit more in depth, 
Um, we have 10 reversals of Alzheimer's um, in our uh, here, but there are hundreds of reversals that doctors are having across the country, thousands at this point. So it goes from mild cognitive impairment to mild dementia, moderate dementia, and then severe dementia. Um, there's, for us and for around the country, there's little to no success with severe dementia. So when we see that, we have a large amount of success here and no success here. So where do you want to start to treat people as a, as a practitioner? When do I want to start getting people in? Yesterday, Yesterday right? <laughs> That's a great answer. You guys know the number one reason why people suffer, uh, someone in their, this is a study, someone in their uh, 60s and 70s would not come in to be assessed for mild cognitive impairment or memory loss, we'll just say memory loss. Even if family's urging them to get in. The number one reason cited by the patient We hear they that think it's old age, but and then go we ahead. hear that there is a decline because of age. So yep. we're assuming, okay, we, I must just fit into that. Yeah. So that's actually number two. Oh. So the number one uh, reason: I don't want to lose my freedom, my driver's license. Oh. And so that was number one. As they're losing their freedom up here, they don't want, I don't even make, can't make that face. Make me, make me cry. Can't cry in front of, I'll well, give them a talk. <laughs> but that's true. Um, and I've had these talks with people, and I, I, I sit down with them and say, I will fight for you to re regain your life. And I will share some positive testimonies as far as someone who had lost their life to the point of not being able to dress himself or know who his family was who got back fully himself and got his life back and he was a pool player and so he was able to play pool with his buddies again and, and enjoy life. Um, mild cognitive impairment is known as a risk factor for dementia so if you already have MCI, mild cognitive impairment, it's another risk factor for dementia. Everyone who experiences dementia passes through the MCI stage first. That's why it's important for us to know if you're there. I'm also, for people online and for people here, going to give you the tools to assess yourself at home to be able to know where you are. But if you also have family members or people that you know, um, they can do the same thing. Because there's stuff you can do at home. This is stuff we should know about. This is stuff we should be doing proactively. When you, are, uh, when you prevent new cases of NCI, you're preventing new cases of dementia. Interesting statement from the Alzheimer's Association who also admits that we have over 130 million people suffering with memory issues and zero cures. And so they've been working on this for a long time and we're gonna to get to um, that statement in a little bit. So this is the dementia trend, number of people with dementia uh, in the millions. And what I found interesting is this is the lower class in different countries. This, this information comes from Alzheimer's Disease International. This is not from the United States or Canada. This is from across the world. And so we are seeing even more compromise in the poorer nations quite a bit. Do you see the difference there? I mean, it's bad in the United States because of our diet and lifestyle, but the people who cannot afford a cleaner world, clean water, clean air, uh, they, and they don't have the resources, they're actually doing worse. Now, there are, and there are reasons for that, which we'll get to, because there are some things in those nations that we need to do that are actually better. When I get into the genetic part of it, too, there's a really interesting fact that I just found, find fascinating. So there's, there's a lot that we're unearthing and uncovering as we go through this process. So dementia as a syndrome. So dementia is not the same as Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's is one form of dementia. But Alzheimer's accounts for 60 to 80% of all dementia. Alzheimer's is where we're having success in preventing and reversing. I want you guys to hear that because for some reason, that's not, that word is not getting out. We are having success with Alzheimer's itself, not the other dementias. There's Lewy body dementia and there's other vascular dementias. We're not seeing success with those with the vascular, Lewy body, or the frontal, frontal temporal, like we are with Alzheimer's. But that accounts for 60 to 80%. It's the, it's the most common by far. 
So I want to just show you, this is very slow, but I want to show you what happens in Alzheimer's. Remember all that space we were talking about? And people may have heard that with Alzheimer's you have the placking that occurs. That's the plaque right there. And then this shrinking of the nerve, that's from the, the tangles, the neurofibrinative tangles. And so that's a tangle and that's a plaque. And so we literally see those tentacles shrink. So when those tentacles are shrinking, they're, they're called dendrites, but when the axons and dendrites shrink, it can no longer touch the other nerves, right? Mm -hmm. So it's lost, what? Communication. They have created medication that will wipe out these plaques, but the memory loss is still there. Why? Because you still, if you lose the communication, it, you basically lose the ability to have the nerves talk to each other. They're not fixing the problem. One of the things I'm also going to talk about is how all of the research for Alzheimer's, not all of it, the majority of research for Alzheimer's is parking down the wrong road. That's why we've spent hundreds of millions of dollars and not gotten the breakthroughs. And the resources for that, uh, we'll talk about in a little bit, are from this book, The End of Alzheimer's. He, is, he was an Alzheimer's researcher, 25 years, and he spoke about his breakthrough. And I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit. I'm going to show you a little interview with him uh, as well. So. When it comes to, I just wanted to blow up this, uh, this picture here, but there's some things, I don't want to get too in-depth there, but tau proteins um, are basically these little fibers in between this. So think of it like an electric cord going, and you've got these little fibers in between, and they break up and they become the tangles. So the inside of the cord, the electric wire basically, is being compromised. A lot of the new lab work that they're trying to identify Alzheimer's with actually are looking for very specific parts of that tau protein. And they call it a breakthrough, but all that does is tell you that you've got it. So that's great. It'll be an easier way to diagnose it much sooner when you start to see those levels start to accumulate in the blood. But you still have to look at what can we do to maintain this super highway of nerves? And then what is causing all the breakdown here? And when I go through the answer to that, because we have the answer to that, We've got the answer to that, but we're not doing anything about it. And, and that's what we're here today to start spreading that message. So does that help kind of see what it looks like from that perspective as well? And when you start to lose these, uh, eventually it'll, this is what it'll look like as far as that is the tangle there and then the plaques. And so that's historically what we look at as doctors as far as uh, what it looks like when you take a, a slice. But we're starting to see the brain start to become compromised. So I want to just paint this picture uh, in, in a different way. When you have cells, cells are either what we call blastic or clastic. Bla blastic is like building, clastic is like cleaving, so breaking down. In osteoporosis, when you are forming bone, it's osteoblastic. When you have osteoclastic, it becomes osteoporosis. Cancer goes from cytoblastic to cytoclastic. In the brain, Alzheimer's goes from synaptoblastic to synaptoclastic. We see the same mechanism across that uh, spectrum. And so these are chronic illnesses as signaling imbalances, communication imbalances. It's like a switch, a light switch, where all of a sudden your DNA goes from I'm going to make cells to break cells. <laughs> if it's in the bone, osteoporosis. If it's in the the, inside the cell by the DNA, it's cancer. And if it's in the brain, it's Alzheimer's. Again, an oversimplistic way, but very accurate, of describing our degenerative states. And they all are influenced by what we'll be talking about next. So the end of Alzheimer's, first program to prevent and reverse cognitive decline, Dr. Bredesen is the, the one who wrote this. He is... Um, who I trained under and did, I went through his uh, coursework uh, three and a half, four years ago. And his story, I, I encourage you, I don't have time to go into it, but his story is a, is a good one. And he was a, a traditionally trained Alzheimer's researcher, did work for Canada, United States, and Australia. And when he, when you, I encourage everyone, if you want good memory, read his book, because that is the foundational information. It really is here. Some of it's a lot of, very sciencey, but he also, he gives you the, the ideas as far as what, uh, where to start. And um, in his research, he accidentally, 
it was an accident, but he identified something that helped with those plaques and, and tangles. Mm -hmm. And so when he went to apply for his grant again to get more funding to do the research, he was denied by the United States, Canada, and Australia. And the reason is because they wanted him to come up with one drug that fixed all of it. Right. The problem was, he said there was 37, mm -hmm. well 36 at the time, since now 37 different pathways that could create that problem. So you'll never come up with the drug that affects all 37 pathways. And so then he had the aha, holy smokes, we're doing this wrong. We are, our research, everything is backwards. Mm -hmm. And then his wife, and this is very, very important guys, always listen to your wife. <laughs> because his wife said, you should check out functional medicine. They have more of, a, uh, of an approach of what you're talking about. And when he did, he says, this is the answer that I was looking for. And so much more research is needed with that. So he didn't get the funding, but he did end up creating this program and has gotten enough along the way over the last six years. Um, and when he, he was on Dr. Oz, and I thought that would uh, catapult a lot of learning, it ended up just getting a lot more attacks than it did actually anything else. So, so that's why it's important for people to learn this, get good at it, and prevent it. Because the proof is in the pudding, yes? Right? So let me just go to Dr. Branson himself. I'm just going to, first uh, five, ten minutes here, or ten minutes, and we're going to just listen to this. Maybe. Alzheimer's disease should be a rare illness. I did not come through uh, a functional medicine background. Uh, I became interested in the brain when I was a college student and read a book called Machinery of the Brain by Dean Wooldridge, and I got very excited about the brain and how it worked and, and uh, began to be interested in the, in the neuroscience of the brain. How does it actually work? What actually goes wrong? And so I went to medical school and trained in neurology. And in neurology, uh, there are a lot of diseases that we can't do much about, and in particular, the neurodegenerative diseases. Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Lewy body, frontotemporal dementia, PSB, on and on, where we have not been successful. And you could argue that it's the area of greatest biomedical failure uh, for the successes that we've had uh, in HIV and the successes that we've had in cancer. We've not had successes in neurodegeneration. So I went back to the lab then after clinical training so that we could understand what are the mechanisms that actually drive these diseases? Why do you get neurodegeneration? And over the years, uh, with the collection of information, we began to see a pattern for what Alzheimer's disease actually is, why you have specific molecules involved, why they actually feed into a specific set of pathways. And we realized that Alzheimer's disease is really about a critical balance that has many, many different inputs to it, dozens and dozens of inputs. Um, not from what we can see, thousands and thousands, but many, many inputs that we had to address. And so what happened was when we started to look at what are actually the things we tell the patients to so imagine 36 holes in a roof, you can cover one hole, it doesn't really help you that much. So we want to be able to address all that after. of the different holes. Mm -hmm. And when we started doing that, we realized it actually fits in very nicely with what functional medicine has been doing in terms of approaches to many different things, from brain disease to hypertension to type 2 diabetes to autoimmune problems. And we realized that what we were seeing from the test tube actually fit in very nicely with a functional medicine approach. So that's how I became interested in functional medicine. What has happened is that we are practicing medicine that's a century out of date, basically. While things have moved forward in Silicon Valley and things have moved forward with iPhones, look what you can do today that you couldn't do even 10 or 15 years ago. Medicine is still being practiced an old-fashioned way where we look for a specific diagnosis. We ask what, what is it? Is it measles? Is it a broken bone? You know, is it rheumatic fever? What is it? And then for each thing, what it is, we get the right, the right prescription, we give them the right thing to do it. That's not the way physiology works. So what we need to do then is to ask in 21st century medicine, instead of to ask what it is, to ask why it is. What are all the contributors? And so we need to close 
what I call the complexity gap. So, for example, you have a computer that can fly a plane, for example, you have to match the program with the uh, with what is required for the plane, with the complexity of what it takes. Now, in medicine, we have a tremendous gap. We have human organisms that are incredibly complex. They have complex chronic illnesses, like neurodegeneration. And what do we ask? Serum sodium, serum potassium, a few things like this. It doesn't come close to addressing it. Therefore, what do we come away with? The idea that these diseases that are complex chronic illnesses are ineluctable. You, you, you can't stop them, you can't see them coming, there's nothing you can do. But that is wrong. If you use larger data sets, if you look further at what is actually driving the problem, we can see this from the laboratory research. Here are the things that actually drive the problem. Then you can see that, in fact, there are specific contributors. And it's virtually never one. It's a combination of contributors that add up to an overall change that leads to a complex chronic illness, like one we would call Alzheimer's disease. So what's accurate to say is reversal of cognitive decline in pre-Alzheimer's and Alzheimer's disease. So what we've reversed is the cognitive decline. You can't say that you reverse the Alzheimer's because there's no pathology yet to say that it's gone. What we can say is that the cognitive decline, which continues down, has now changed and now reversed, and now people have improved. And we see this, this is now several hundred people. We reported the first 19 in two different reports, but this is now in several hundred people. So the, we recommend, though, that everybody, just as everyone should get a colonoscopy when they turn 50, everyone should get a cognoscopy when they turn 45 or over. If you're 55, 60, whatever, check out where you stand and see. You can do this with genetic testing, blood testing, functional testing, and if you're already symptomatic, then including imaging in that. But if you're not, you don't necessarily need to include the imaging. But you should know where you stand. And definitely, if you have uh, one copy of ApoE4, you have an increased risk for Alzheimer's disease, that disease over someone who has zero copies. And if you have two copies, of course, that's increased further, and it's, it's very likely that you will develop it during your lifetime. The reality is Alzheimer's disease should be a rare illness, because if everyone simply checked ahead of time and got on the appropriate program, we would not see such a high incidence of Alzheimer's disease. Okay. So a few, few gems there, there's a lot more, he could go on for um, an hour with, with that, but he was talking about ApoE4, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. There's a genetic, there's a gene, we've identified the gene, it's called ApoE um, gene, and if you are ApoE4, meaning you got ApoE4 from mom and from dad, your risk increases drastically. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get Alzheimer's in your... Uh, 70s or 60s, but if you have ApoE4 from mom and dad, you can actually get it in your 50s. You can also prevent it from happening until very, very end stage. So we had one um, of our uh, Alzheimer's patients who was struggling uh, very much, came in, we did have success with him. He was in his 80s, which is, once you get into the 80s, that also works against you quite a bit, and he got his life back. He ended up passing away but uh, from something else uh, a couple of years uh, later, or a little bit while later, and he had a good quality of life right up until the end. And that's what we're looking for. So even with the bad genes, you can still uh, push everything off as far as what you're genetically up against. So this is basically the, the aging part of it. There's a lot of things that, this is again from the Alzheimer's Association, so they've identified stuff that worked against us. The, gen the gene, so just knowing, if you're concerned about whether or not uh, you have, uh, why you have memory loss or even that being healthy, uh, getting that test done is very important. That's part of the cognoscopy, which is one of the other things he mentioned. Cognoscopy is a standard test for uh, memory for the prevention of Alzheimer's, and there's, uh, there's just a lot of information in there. And so it's beyond the traditional lab testing. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit in the, in the future here. But look what they also, across the lifespan, physical activity, cognitive and social activity. Does that sound familiar? A, activity, action, 
And so uh, basically, uh, there's also obesity, high blood pressure, dyslipidemia, depression, alcohol, diabetes, smoking, unhealthy diet. Those have all been looked at and are potential triggers for a lot of that. So the risk, the impact of uh, uh, for Alzheimer's disease, the impact on the neurons, viability for it to survive. So other than the fuel supply and the activation, it needs protection. So inflammation, oxidative stress. Oxidative stress are, are free radicals, basically. Oxidative stress is uh, uh, handled by antioxidants. Does anyone know where antioxidants come from? Primarily from our food, food source. What food has antioxidants? Fruits and vegetables. Fruits and vegetables, good job, that's right. So again, fruits and vegetables have the nutrients, but if our nutrients are depleted from farming practices or from chemicals or from heavy metals, which they do, they deplete the nutrient value. One cup of spinach in the same farm field does not have the same iron it does today that it had in 1950. So it's important to know that because when grandma and grandpa grew up on the farm and they ate from their own garden and they lived to be 98 and you're wondering why at 50 you look like they did at 98 and feel like that, it could be because you've not been eating the nutrients that they've been eating. Does that make sense? Uh, oxidative stress, glucose metabolism, endothelial cell damage. I want you guys to uh, hang on to that one. Endothelial cell damage. That's the lining of the blood vessels. If you have a lot of free radicals, it will damage the lining of the blood vessels. One of the things that I'll talk about here uh, at Synapse, we are uh, one of three facilities that have a machine that measures the endothelial lining. The Mayo Clinic that has one, the U of M has one, and we have one. But we are the only one using nutritional therapies to actually correct that. And our outcomes are very good for our cardiovascular uh, patients. So getting your endothelial cell, uh, I'll go through that a little bit later. Clearance of tau and the beta amyloid from the brain. The, that's the placking. So getting those cleared properly from the brain is also very important. Your immune system does that. So in the brain, we have what's called, have you guys heard of a lymphatic network, our lymph system? When kids are young, their lymph nodes swell. Well, in the brain, it's called a glymphatic system. Guess what releases the glymphatic system to start working better than anything else? Deep sleep. Again, if you're not getting into deep sleep, you've just lost the ability for your immune system, for the brain, to clean it up. And then you can't get rid of tau and beta amyloid from the brain. So, and this is again, and I'm not being, um, I am, I guess I'm being critical of the, the research. The research that's out there is phenomenal. They're brilliant at what they're doing, but they're looking for a medication that can clear out the placking and the tau proteins when we know deep sleep does that. So why not work on getting that part of it addressed. There's more to it, it's way more complex than that. So all my scientists that are working in the lab, I still love you guys, just, just know that there's, we've gotta get these basic foundational things uh, working. So this is a perfect example. This is the uh, P-Tau-217. This is a, a new research that's coming out and they, they get really excited about this, but the reality is there has not been a medication that's been approved that's done anything effective since 2003 for Alzheimer's, per Dr. Bresson in his book. Now, something might be coming out in, within the next year, but again, it's only gonna tell us that you have Alzheimer's. It doesn't help with the why, like he said. That's what, that's part of the problem. A lot of the promising research, and you hear this time and time again. I remember watching the news, there'd be a new miracle drug, a new miracle drug, and then two years later, you don't hear anything about that. All, these, all this promise because of research, but it's not, they're, they're getting closer to getting closer. Well, we, we've been doing this for decades, and it's just going down the wrong path. Mm -hmm. So again, that tau protein right there, uh, looking at why is that breaking down is much more important. So, how is your memory? This is where I'm gonna give a test to everyone in the room now. I'm joking. Uh, I want you guys to know, this actually comes from, um, from uh, California, but 
Uh, I use the British Columbia guidelines for this. It's the same quiz, but you can go to the um, website here. Down here, you can take a picture of that, or just Google the Alzheimer's questionnaire with the letter A and Q afterwards. It's the AQ21 questionnaire, and I just want to walk you through that here. And you can take this questionnaire just to give us, get yourself a sense. It's pretty easy, and uh, if you want to do it, assess someone else, it's kind of set up that way. So does your loved one have memory loss? Yes, that's one point. No, zero. If so, is their memory loss worse than a few years ago? Yes, one point, no, zero. And then some of them have two points. Does the patient repeat questions or statements or stories in the same day? Yes, two points. So at the end, you add them up, and your score will tell you basically um, where you're at as far as some of the, the challenges. Zero to four, no cause for concern. Five to 14, memory loss may be early warning of Alzheimer's, and 15 and above, Alzheimer's may already have developed. So this one in particular is very important uh, to just get on top of. It doesn't diagnose anything. This is one marker. There are dozens of memory tests um, that we do to actually assess different parts of the brain, and you can get much more in depth. This is just something that is actually of value at home that most people don't know about something that's a little more systematic. So with that, um, there's also a smell test. This is my favorite one, because I was speaking with an Alzheimer's researcher, and they were actually creating a new tool that, I, that was very good. I love the research they were doing. They were surprised that uh, when we spoke that I knew about this one. It's because I'm a peanut butter lover. And so there's a smell test. You put peanut butter at the bottom of a ruler, and I'll show you a picture in a second, and you measure the distance from the nostril to the patients where the where they're first able to detect the uh, smell. So you have a peanut butter down here, and if they smell it here, that's good, but you've got one nostril plug. There was a difference between the left and the right nostril. This is fascinating to me. Patients who detected the odor at least six centimeters worse with the left nostril than the right all, were also more likely to be diagnosed with Alzheimer's. So it's the peanut butter smell test. This is what it looks like. So we've done this with our patients, and it is, uh, you never just diagnose off of one thing, but it is amazingly accurate. Uh, all of our Alzheimer's patients that we've been assessing, not all of them, but uh, a good 80%, did have this as a variable, still. And then uh, many of them have lost their sense of smell, so uh, that, had, uh, that was tough. And then of course COVID threw a wrench into all of that, right? So we just lost that test during COVID. So, uh, we don't have a handout. No, that is uh, that is uh, something that if you go back and look at this, or if you just um, again Google Alzheimer's peanut butter smell test. Everyone likes to stuff like that. They like to to show I don't know, TikToks of. I don't know what they do. <laughs> All right. So I uh, just want to go through some of the numbers. So this is important to know, uh, again, and I go through these things, not because you guys aren't aware of the problem, but the reality is our baby boomers are coming to that age now where we're, gonna, where we're seeing an influx, right? Mm -hmm. So when the baby boomers were babies, diapers went through the roof as far as that market, and then elementary schools, and then high schools, and then different things. So as the, the baby boomers have set these bubbles or trends, well, right now, unfortunately, it's an Alzheimer's trend. And we've seen the numbers go up quite a bit, and they've been increasing quite a bit. Right now, in the United States, a new case of Alzheimer's is diagnosed every 66 seconds. So during this presentation, um, uh, two hours, there's been a dozen, more than a dozen people diagnosed. Family members are trying to take care of loved ones. They provide themselves $271 billion in unpaid care. And if anyone's ever taken care of someone with memory, you guys know um, how much work that is, right? I have taken care of more caretakers than I have people with Alzheimer's because of the consequence. It's just, it's, it's a tough, tough scenario. But the estimate is $271 billion of unpaid care that they're doing for their loved ones, which is amazing and awesome, but tough. 
right? And if we want to be better, get better, and get good at this, we have to take care of them as well. National average baseline cost is seven thousand dollars a month in 2021. Uh, this is for the and as high as twelve thousand dollars a month. This is for a memory home. When someone has Alzheimer's and they have to, they're going to a home, the cost is seven thousand dollars a month, and in Washington D.C. is twelve thousand dollars a month. They're, they're at the highest, and so there is a huge expense, and there are only certain circumstances where. Um, Medicare will only cover it at end stage, and so that's majority of that is out of pocket. So there's a lot for a lot of people. There are some uh, exceptions to that. In Canada, they have a different program up there, um, but the, the numbers are the same as far as the expenses, and it just gets put out in other areas. So we're seeing a bubble. In Canada, this is from their uh, information, senior population expected to grow by 68% over the next 28 years or the next 20 years, sorry. The healthcare system cost was 50,000 per person, net over five years. Uh, the terminal acute care drove the cost the highest. So why is that relevant? If we can prevent mm -hmm. a lot of this, it really minimizes the length of time for the terminal acute care. And so years ago, this has nothing to do with Alzheimer's, but has to do with quality of life and health. They did a study and showed, they compared healthy people to unhealthy people. Interestingly enough, the Unhealthy people were categorized as unhealthy because they said they didn't pay attention to diet, lifestyle, and they were on two, more than two medications. They were considered unhealthy. The healthy population paid attention to diet, lifestyle, and were on, on less than two medications. Mm -hmm. And they found that the unhealthy group only outlived the healthy group by three months on average. Sounds weird, right? You put all this work and effort into it, you only outlive them by three months. But the unhealthy group live with their degenerative disease an average of 15 years compared to an average of three months. So it's really quality of life. And expense, expense to the healthcare system. And it doesn't matter what kind of healthcare system it is, you still, whether it's Canada or the United States, you're, it's still in the same cost as far as how it affects uh, everyone. Um, Six million Americans in 2022 with Alzheimer's cost 321 billion plus the estimated 271 billion Uncare, unpaid caregiving. So you're at basically uh, $700 billion, and we're expecting that number to increase drastically over the next 20 years. So again, President Obama had in uh, 2012 30 million people, third leading cause of death, um, dementia, and consequences to dementia. Same, same problem. And estimate by 2050, 160 million. Women are at the epicenter center of the epidemic. And there's something here, again, I gotta, the guys are kind of getting bashed here a little bit, but uh, sorry guys, I'm with you. But women are at the epicenter here, 65% are women with Alzheimer's and 60% of the caregivers are women. This is more common than breast cancer for women. I want you to let that sink in. The other thing I'm just gonna say, um, one of our, when we're looking to work with people uh, with this, and I will say last year, the last two years with COVID, that changed things uh, quite a bit. Um, we had to be very discerning because uh, it's very challenging to take on uh, and do this program and treat these patients. So I had to say no to over 30 people with Alzheimer's for the last, for the last two years. And one of our things that we look at is uh, success, successful outcomes. One of the markers for sex, successful outcome is the age of the patient, but also, are they a male? Men have a higher rate of success than women for outcomes, partially, mainly due to compliance, because the men weren't as quite capable at the caretaking part of it. Does that make sense? Older generation, a lot of men didn't know how to cook for their wife. They didn't know how to take care of their wife. That was, that's one of the factors we had to look at. So if they can't, do they have friends or family that can step in? If they didn't, unfortunately we couldn't. We know what a heavy lift this is for the caretakers. Mm -hmm. So just be aware of that. And this is a um, one of those scenarios where uh, I want people to know if you're doing this yourself, if you're listening online and you're doing this yourself, ask for help. It's kind of like when you have a drowning victim, 
You have to knock them out to save their life, right? But you, but we can't knock knock them out in, in this type of uh, scenario. Is we have to ask for help. We have to. This is not an easy thing to do by yourself, and we don't want you to be taken down out of love, right? Because everyone who does that is 100% because they love they love that person that much. So, what's the solution for brain health and, and memory? First thing is the awareness part of it. And so, number one, uh, the questionnaire that we gave you, I encourage you all to just look at family, friends, and just look at how am I doing with memory? How are they doing with memory? A lot of times we give excuses because we remember how they used to be. Uh, or, or you don't want that to even think that it's a thing. So yourself, family, and friends, awareness is the first step. Uh, following a diet um, that is uh, healthy, basically. And the preventative healthy diet is different than when someone has full-blown Alzheimer's. So for those of you that are um, uh, watching online or you're here, go back to our website and you can look at uh, the Synapse Memory Program. And on that, that site, you'll be able to uh, download click on the diet, uh, so that's the diet therapy for memory. So if you're watching online or when you guys get back home, it's on our website, it'll always be there along with the link to this, uh, this talk. And it'll just talk you through some of the real basics for um, the memory diet. And then also there's a memory pack on there that's just a real basic pack to help for brain health. Other than the diet and lifestyle part of it, there's a few things nutritionally that can get some a lot of the, the uh, factors. And I'm going to go through the details of that. So hang with me. You guys are doing a great job um, trying to get through the basics here so that you guys can get the information you can take home with you. So I'm going to go through some of the I, different types of Alzheimer's so that you can see um, what we're talking about. And this information, like I said, a lot of it is in, not all of it, but a lot of it is in the book, The End of Alzheimer's, by Dr. Dale Bredesen. And you'll be able to um, uh, glean a lot of information there. So there's actually uh, six types. It's weird because uh, they identify five types, and then one of them is kind of a mix of the other two. So they call it 1.5. So there's type 1, 1 1.5, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So I'm going to spend a little time on this. Number one, the type of Alzheimer's that they've talked about is called inflammatory. If you have too much inflammation in the brain, that's like a forest fire going on, and that can also take down those nerves and tentacles. So inflammation of the brain. Number two is atrophic. This is called cold. Atrophic is when we lose hormone influence too quickly. So menopause can become a trigger for Alzheimer's. Uh, in the right situation and scenario, especially if you have the genes, the ApoE4. And again, they have ApoE4, ApoE3, ApoE2, and the more close you are to the 4, the more likely you are to develop Alzheimer's. But I mentioned before, there's something interesting with that. It also, the, the people in uh, with Alzheimer's in Africa who have ApoE4 are, um, they don't suffer as well if they have a parasitic infection. Hmm. So if they have parasites, so ApoE4 here in the United States actually help people when it comes to the parasites. But in Africa, if they have that ApoE4 gene and they have a parasite, they, they actually do better. So there's stuff there that's pretty intriguing. I think that's fascinating. What do you guys think? That's, yeah, there's something to that as far as where you come from and the land that you're, that you're a part of. It's interesting. Um, and that also shows that we don't know, have all the answers yet, right? That's the other part of it. Number three, glycotoxic. So glycotoxic is the sugar. They used to call, I remember calling uh, uh, dementia or Alzheimer's or type three diabetes or diabetes of the brain. We used to call that back in the day because all of these people with blood sugar issues um, could develop a dementia. Well now we know it's one of the six different categories. Glycotoxic, glycolic glyco sugar, glyco 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 sugar. There's also toxics. So these are the environmental toxins we were talking about, the chemicals, the environmental chemicals. And some of those, like I said, can disrupt your hormones. So you stop making the hormones, it can cause the atrophic. So when Dr. Bredesen said, it's 
not just one pathway. There's multiple pathways. A lot of times these things will affect the other pathways. So toxins, again, anything your body doesn't recognize, anything that's foreign is considered a toxin. I have a general rule of thumb. If God made it, it's good. If man made it, just beware. We tend not to get it right. So we have chemicals that are foreign to our body that we put in our body, and then the body doesn't know what to do with it. So it either detoxifies it out, or if it doesn't, it stores it in fat. So some people are trying to lose fat, but they can't. Could be because their bodies hang on to the toxins. Fat's our best insulator in our body. Also, what is the brain made out of? Fat. So eventually, if there's nowhere to store it, it may go to the brain. The last two, I'm just going to say, uh, now Dr. Bredesen may have different research, but um, the last two I've had the least amount of success with. The vascular and the traumatic. I did a lot of work with traumatic brain injury early in my career, 20-some years ago. One of my patients uh, that I currently see right now is in his mid-90s. Um, he was the father of that patient that I worked with in 1997. And it was just in last week, so it's been a long time I've been working with him and, and his family. Vascular, though, it, there's a little bit of success, but these two are our least successful. So Alzheimer's that we determine has been brought on by a traumatic event and brain injury, we may, not, we may not be treating them. But it doesn't mean you can't do a lot of the other things to see if there's an impact there. The worst thing is just to think that there's, there's nothing you can do. I, I refuse to live in a world with no hope, right? So it's important um, to just be putting something into play. And if it works with the other ones, see if there's any benefit there. If there is, great. Uh, if there's not, then uh, you try it. The vascular part of it, uh, we can clean up the vascular system quite a bit, but if it's already too compromised by time, they, they get to us, there's already too much damage. The one thing I will say, there is technologies coming out that can uh, look like they may aid in the regrowth and regeneration of some of these tissues. That's a game changer. If that comes out, I'm on board. Because all of a sudden now, we've got a different scenario. So that, that would be phenomenal. So all the scientists online keep going in that direction. All right, so this is just some of the features for the subtypes. Uh, for the inflammatory one, family history is common. Yes, yes, yes. Type 3, toxic, no, because that's environment. So it's whatever you're exposed to. Usual age of onset, inflammatory in the seventh decade, eighth decade for the, the uh, hormone one, uh, seventh decade for the glycotoxic, fifth, sixth, or seventh decade for the toxin. Now here's the scary thing. We just had someone in their late 40s, early 50s with the hot one, inflammatory. That means they aged their cells to the point of a 70 year old within 50 years. Does that make sense? I'm gonna say it a different way because this is true for the sweet one as well, the glycotoxic. When I was first going through uh, medical school and then eventually chiropractic school, they taught us, when it came to diabetes, there's two types, childhood diabetes and adult onset diabetes. You guys remember that? Remember, raise your hand if you remember that was what they used to call them, yeah? They changed the names, didn't they, right? Why did they change the names? Because childhood, you were a kid when you got it. Adult was, was basically people got between the age of 50 and 70. But then all of a sudden something started happening. People started getting it in their 40s, and then their 30s and then their 20s. And then they said, we can't have this, it's not adult, now we've got teenagers getting it. So we don't want to confuse them. So now they call it type one and type two. Type two is when you burn out the use of your pancreas making insulin. Type one is autoimmune. So these people were basically, eventually, it got down to now the youngest type two diabetic is eight years old, a child. That person, burned out their use of insulin within eight years. So that means they aged the cells of that organ eight years to what used to be 50 or 70 years. So these 20 year olds that are getting it have basically aged their cells to that of a 50 or 70 year old because of sugar. So that's a multi-generational thing where they were not regulating sugar properly. Does that make sense? That's, that's mostly diet and lifestyle. 
and we're speeding up our aging process with diet and lifestyle. And so we're seeing the same trend here. People getting memory issues in their 50s and 60s when it used to be 70s and 80s. That's why it's so important to be talking about this uh, right now. So you heard Dr. Branson talk about a roof with 36 holes. So that's, that's his analogy of how, what's going on. He found 36 different pathways, 36 different things in the body that can lead to the breakdown of uh, the tau protein, T-A-U, tau protein, or um, getting the plaque in. And so what he said is, as you get these medications that are coming out, they're, they're filling one hole here, but you still have 35 other holes. And that's how he knew they'll never come up with a solution if they keep on that track because you're only filling one hole of the 36. And that's why he says you have to look at all 36, and not necessarily all 36, because that's very expensive. That'd, that'd be almost $20,000 worth of lab work if you did all 36. You have to discern through uh, lab testing, physical assessment, uh, experience uh, in the world. For example, if you were a welder, that's relevant to us. So we have to look at what you do professionally, meaning what toxins we're exposed to. So we, when we go through and assess someone for their memory, we look at what have you been exposed to. Were you a farmer? Was it an organic farm? Or did you use Roundup? Did you use other chemicals? Uh, there are a whole list of, of conversations that have to be had and identified with someone who's lost their ability to remember, potentially, what they've been exposed to and what they did. There's, there's the, the challenge, yes? So this is what he came up with. In order for him, he was a little upset with the, um, the governments um, as far as their funding because they said, we need one medication that's going to solve the whole problem. He said, okay, this is what that one medication would have to do. It would have to take care of all of these biochemical pathways in the body for it to work. So it would have to increase my microglial uh, clearance of the beta packet, uh, Packing, have to increase autophagy. By the way, this is my favorite right now. Um, autophagy, do you know what increases autophagy? Fasting. Yes! Hey, so smart. <laughs> Fast, fasting. Also things like the ketogenic diet does and also uh, the carnivore diet does as well can increase autophagy. And so, but to my point before, we, we try and look for all of these medications to, to do these things, and we do have some natural things in place. Now, I'm not saying anyone with memory loss go and fast, but, but you can try intermittent fasting, and the right, for the right people, fasting can induce autophagy. Now, if it's too far down a particular pathway, that's not going to work because there's 35 other holes. But early in life, fasting is so good for you, and we don't do that right now, especially with the abundance. Now, if you're listening to this, um, I, I was actually on a podcast uh, for a, um, a leopard colony in Madagascar, so they actually can listen to some of the stuff that we do. So if you're listening in Madagascar and you're not eating in abundance or an excessive abundance of food like we do here in the United States, fasting may be relevant, but not the same thing, right? So know where you're coming from. The other thing that really sneaks in there, homocysteine. Homocysteine too high is one of the easy markers. It's a blood marker. We can get this test done, and if it's over 10 in the blood, that increases your risk of stroke and cardiovascular compromise to the point of affecting the brain. And I've, I have, one of my big frustrations um, was identifying these things. And I have a patient from Canada um, who identified uh, main triggers for their Alzheimer's, sent them back, and they didn't do anything with them because they didn't know. The doctors didn't know because this wasn't on the radar. And they, they didn't have anything in their wheelhouse. So I told them basically, this is what we do. Because reducing homocysteine is pretty easy. You, you just put methylators in their, in their body, which are B vitamins and things like choline. A couple supplements can reduce that inflammatory neurotoxin mm. and it just wasn't done, it wasn't followed through with because it wasn't understood. So it's important, again, and a medication is not going to do that and affect your cortisol, DHA, testosterone, optimize estradiol, estradiol vitamin D signaling. There's just, it's not going to exist. So again, to his point, he's now identified 37 holes in that, uh, in that barn and we need
need to look at how many, and the average Alzheimer's patient that we treat has 17 of those 37 points already out of balance. The average person with mild cognitive impairment has six to eight. So it's a lot easier to work with that early on. So here's the ACOE4 stats. This is just a lifetime risk. People can take a look at that. But uh, again, if you have two copies of the ApoE4, 15 to 90% lifetime risk, uh, or 7 million Americans. So that's a huge range, 50 to 90%. So it's one of those things like, if you have it, um, you just have to be a little bit more on top of it earlier. That's all I'm gonna say, because we can still see significant changes. One of my uh, patients that went through our program for prevention, uh, in her 50s, every female in her um, family has it over the age of 50, uh, in their 60s and 70s, and so she wanted to be proactive. She was able E4-4, so both parents, and um, did it early 50s and phenomenal results, and she's now maintained. She knows what to look at to help prevent uh, her scenario and uh, to stay on top of it. So without fear, worry, or concern, is moving through enjoying life, and, and but is very disciplined with, uh, with her, what works for her and what doesn't. It's working great. Here's that one. Increase inflammation, thus increasing risk for Alzheimer's disease, but reduces risk for parasite-associated dementia. So parasites and other infections can cause dementia, but if you have ApoE4, that goes out the window. So just interesting little things that we've identified. All right, so proactive approach. Uh, we're going to just summarize here. Um, range. 5.2, 5.3 for a hemoglobin A1c is great. Uh, uh, blood sugar, fasting blood sugar uh, around 80 to 85 is ideal. Vitamin D. We know vitamin D is the number one immune regulator. And so for us, the optimal range is 50 to 80. I can't tell you how many people come in with a vitamin D of 30 and their doctors say that's normal, which it is to help with osteoporosis and things like that, but 50 to 80 is optimal. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of people with um, low vitamin D that have 40 and still have symptoms because of all the other factors as well. So 50 to 80 is ideal. Homocysteine, this is very, very important between six or seven. Now, here's the interesting, interesting thing with uh, homo homocysteine. If it's too low, that is a potential sign of toxic exposure in, in your body. So if it's too low, like a two or three, that's not necessarily good either, because that usually means you've been exposed to something toxic, and there's a mechanism in the body that will pull homocysteine and make it turn into glutathione, which is our main antioxidant for detoxifying chemicals and metals. So we we have found a lot of people um, with toxic issues that actually had low homocysteine, but that's why I like this test. These are three easy tests that can be put on any standard labs. Cholesterol, all that stuff's still important, but if you can add these basic labs, blood sugar they always assess, but make sure it's the hemoglobin A1C, but if you can add the vitamin D and homocysteine, that is an also potential indicator of dysfunction. Those are two, these three here are three of the holes in that uh, scenario. discerning that has to occur there. 
So one of the things that we've done um, is I'm going to go through some of uh, the options. Uh, like I said, if you go to the website, you can work on the basics and take the memory pack. Uh, and then listen to some of the things we talked about, the exercise, the sleep hygiene. Those basics can really help with memory. If you find yourself uh, confused or uh, not remembering your, your words very well, uh, there are three, three parts to the memory. One is the laying down of memory, one is the memory recall, and so and then the other one I can't remember. Literally, sorry. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. So when it comes to the actual, um, if you can't remember people's names, don't worry about that one actually. That is very very common, and not there's a challenge with the laying down of the memory of people's names with that one. If it's forgetting where you put your keys or you find them in the fridge, that's a different story, right? Why, why did I walk into this room? Different story. Some people, if you just restore the sleep, the memory comes back. Mm -hmm. For example, young parents, again, if you have kids and you're sleep deprived and you call them every other name but theirs, or you basically go in and you can't remember why you walked into the room and then you get a good couple of nights sleep and then you're fine, that's just sleep deprivation. That's an acute scenario. But if we're seeing that, and the, there's no kids there, uh, you still might be getting sleep deprivation without ever knowing it. So that's very, very important. So I'm also gonna go through our, our program. So we use, the majority of what we use, um, uh, like I said, I was trained with Dr. Bredesen. We released this program on an individual basis back in 2018, 2019. Everything got put on hold uh, during COVID because of, uh, because of COVID, and we had to change uh, gears a little bit. But um, we've got four, six, and 12-month programs. It is a heavy lift if, you're, if there's full-blown Alzheimer's. So we only accept a certain number of patients right now. Our goal, though, is to help people um, create awareness and then to have multiple clinics truly getting to people before it even becomes an Alzheimer's. So again, predictors of success for people to come into our programs, we have to look at um, successful outcomes. If they're below the age of 75, much, much higher level of success. We did take an 83-year-old, and we did have a successful outcome um, only because we felt uh, there were some other things that were uh, working in his benefit. He had a ton of family support, and uh, he, his main challenge was more glycotoxic, which for me is the easiest one to fix. I'm not going to say use the word easy. None, none of this is easy. So uh, if they're pre-symptomatic, a predictor of success, if they have the precognitive impairment, uh, especially if the, the, they're amne amnestic or identifiable contributors, meaning we know what's causing it, uh, mild cognitive impairment, if it's early Alzheimer's, uh, non-type three, um, and then atrophy limited to the hippocampus, that's if, if we get uh, an MRI of the brain and the atrophy is only in that one area, we know we've got um, high level of success. Uh, some of the other hidden ones, I forgot to mention this, that they're on the list, but one of the other hidden triggers that is common worldwide is mold. Mold in the home will affect your ability, it'll affect inflammation in the brain, and it'll affect your hormones and your GI tract. And it's one of the hidden ones that will cause people to not recover when they should. So mold is one of those ones that doesn't matter if you're in Canada, Mexico, United States, even dry areas have problems with mold in their homes. Minnesota, where we're um, shooting this, is got a lot of lakes. You'd expect a lot of flooding. We've got basements, which we do have a lot of mold here, but we are still second to Arizona, which is very dry. But Arizona floods. They don't have basements like we do, but they, they, they flood. So the water doesn't get um, brought up. So a lot of things, a lot of damage occurs. So Arizona actually is very bad for, for mold in a lot of their homes. That's one of the other things that's on. Uh, I've spoken with people um, in the construction world, and they have mold-resistant buildings for corporations, for corporate buildings, but not for housing, for people. That's gonna change too. We are working actively on creating awareness in that field as well, because mold toxicity in the home is one of the most challenging things to overcome for anyone, um, but it's also expensive. 
I, people know, some of the people here have been through things, that uh, there's expenses to it um, that can really become problematic. We, in our personal home, that happened with us. We suspected it, um, and, but we had it checked and it passed the tests. And then two years into the home, we saw that uh, there was a little spot on our carpet that was in the middle of the room, and we first ruled out the child with a drink. So, you know, we got to that, got through that. Turns out, and when we pulled up the carpet too, there were the, the floorboards had started to separate. There was a hardwood floor underneath, started to separate. There was a problem with one corner of our house, and the house was actually sinking because the water and mold had damaged the two by fours and, and ate right through. This was in a house that passed inspection. Mm -hmm. This was in a house that passed inspection and a water test because I didn't want to have to deal with mold. And we found a bunch of mold. And so it is um, very, very common and unfortunately sneaks through the radar of a lot of doctors and a lot of people. They don't, they don't see that. So I wanted to throw that one out there just to create more awareness. And it's one of the 37 holes. Uh, predictors of failure, if it's too advanced, uh, if they're on multiple medications. So medications, uh, again, slow down the healing process for us, the way we like to work with it. Multiple medications. And that's something we look at. We've had people um, come in and they want to do a, a memory program, but they're on 16 medications. Well, we have to first get them off those medications, which can take, not all of them, but the, it, that can take a long time. That could take two years by itself. So we have to discern and almost triage um, who we work with and who we don't. Um, type three, the toxic one, that can be especially if they're beyond the MCI, that's Dr. Bresson. We actually, we actually have had more success with that. So I, I, it's because we have some unique ways to detoxify the body that I think are helping us here at Cinex. All right, so again, work on the basics and take the memory pack. The link is on a website. Here's the, the website right here. And uh, I'll, I'll maybe pull that up real quick so you guys can see, because when, once you visualize it, you can remember it better, right? Hearing it's one thing. Visualizing it's another thing. Experiencing it is even more. That's how we increase the memory. All right, so this is the slide just if you're the reason why you came today to get better uh, with memory, this is what you want to focus on. Get good at all of these things. Sleep hygiene. There are ways to assess, and this is why this could take a whole week seminar, but just sleep I could talk about for a whole day. There are ways to assess your sleep. We even have mattresses that do that now, sleep number beds. We have rings called Aura Rings, Aura.com, O-U-R-A.com, can tell you if you're getting into deep sleep or something is disrupting it. Uh, we have um, Fitbits and things like that. Although they're not ideal like a sleep disorder study, they're still going to give you some idea of how you're doing. Stay hydrated. This is an easy thing to say, hard to do. We live in a world that is chronically inflamed because of everything around us. Fire pulls water out of the atmosphere. There is a video in our media section, and I, I uh, shot it, um, or put it together back in 2014 on our website. I've been doing it for years. Um, it's called Your Immune System Under the Microscope, and I explain how your immune system takes care of an infection, and if you're dehydrated, it can't. Your immune cells literally swim. So you can go to the, the website in the media section and look for your immune system under the microscope. It's also on our YouTube channel your immune system under the microscope. And the one benefit I will say that came out of COVID when it came to that was that video had a couple thousand views on it, 10, 20, 30,000, I can't remember. And then through COVID, I think we're at 1.6 million now or something like that views uh, of just a, a four minute video of, of what the immune system looks like under the microscope. So check that one out and that will help you with the stay hydrated part. Move. Does everyone know why moving is so important now? Right? We've heard it this whole time. Motion is life is what we were taught in school, but to keep our brain active, we have to physically keep moving. That's one part of it. Diet. That's also available on the website, the one I just put up here to start. It is different, 
Um, I will say if you're ever going to do a full Alzheimer's treatment uh, or program, we do put you on a ketogenic or uh, a, something that induces autophagy. So, it, which is different than the preventative program. So the preventative program has more antioxidants and more things to, to kind of get more of the, the surface. The autophagy helps your immune system clean up the damage. And so if there's a lot of damage there, we have to be a little more aggressive with the diet. Stress management. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy, right? Everyone just, no more stress, please. Detox by fasting. If you can't fast, you always start with intermittent fasting, but get good at fasting. There's a lot of education about that as well. Fasting is one of the things that will really help with a lot of the different scenarios. Um, avoid chemicals. Again, I am a huge proponent of organic food, supporting our organic farmers, and, and just avoiding as many chemicals uh, as possible. Uh, the website's called ewo.org, and they'll also talk about chemicals in our environment that are causing harm. Uh, makeup is number one in that category. And so we see a lot of toxic issues, in particular affecting the brain, when you lose your defense mechanisms and then you're putting toxins on your face every day. Uh, reduce inflammation, smoking, alcohol, sugar, sedentary mind and body. Remember, sitting is the new smoking. And what do we do more of now? Kids, adults, yeah, work. I have people, I, I don't know if you guys have experienced this, but I have days where I treat people all day long, which I absolutely love because I'm up and I'm moving and I'm back and forth. Then I have days where I have to write reports on my computer all day long. I have to do paperwork, paperwork, computer work. You know, they don't have paper anymore. <laughs> so everything's on the computer. Eight hours on the computer is the equivalent to five days as far as how tired I am. I can do five days of regular treatment of patients back and forth, one day on the computer by itself and I'm exhausted. And it's, it's because of the lack of feedback to my brain. And I. As I'm working with patients all the time, I always am saying, I'm so thankful that I have a job that I get up and I'm physically active with. Because people always say, doesn't this wear you out, the physical part of it? And I say, no, that's the good part. It's the sitting in the chair all day long. And then most of the people I see sit in chairs all day long, staring at a computer. Just saw one yesterday uh, in his 20s who um, puts in 16 hour days right now. He's working at home, and since doing that, again, since COVID, he doesn't get up from his chair except for a couple times. And he's starting to really decline um, physically. So he's actually doing better now, but that's one of the things we talked about. You have to get up and move. You can't be on your computer doing the work all that time. So he went and spoke to his boss, and his boss is watching. I apologize, but it wasn't healthy for him. Oh, I thought you had a question. <laughs> question. Um, all right. So, some of the uniquenesses we're going to finish up here. I appreciate everyone hanging in there. Again, if you're having trouble with sleep, just come to one of these talks and we'll put you to sleep. <laughs> it's very therapeutic, very healthy for you. Um, so, we have at the Synapse, uh, within the programs, we use the endopad. I spoke about that briefly. That measures the endothelial dysfunction. It also measures how stiff your arteries are. And it measures if you're in fight or flight the stress response. If you're in fight or flight or rest and digest, we get three different markers for that. Uh, we also have what's called a hocket. A hocket is a 10-in-1, I'll go through these in a little bit, 10-in-1 <coughs> detox uh, treatment. And we have different technologies, the M technologies are called, m sculpt m toma and I'm gonna go through that in a little bit. We also do something very different. So when it comes to um, working with this program, we found that it was very hard on the caretaker. I mentioned this before. So a couple of two years into it, then COVID, and we, uh, my heart just went out to the caretakers because they were doing everything for the patient. So our program, we put together treatment for the caretaker. So we want to make sure that they're healthy. A lot of times they go through the same diet, which is very good, but when their, their significant other or whoever's helping is here with them, we're doing treatments with them as well. More relaxation, more rebuilding of uh, what's going on with them to replenish them, to help them through the process. And I think that's a really important part of it, taking care of the caretaker. Uh, but also uh, uh, group support. We found that when you do it as a group, 
Uh, and this is why we do once a year, you're going to see us um, put the, maybe twice a year, we're going to see, put together our programs. We only accept people during that time. Because uh, when you do it as a group, you've now got the buddy system and you have people going through the same thing. So when we meet and do classes, you can talk about what you're doing well and what you're not. You can talk outside of the clinic because you can't always reach the docs and the therapists. Having that, that village um, community mindset for healing is a big part of the healing process. They don't feel alone, and you actually will be shocked how creative people are. I had, uh, th this came to me when I had one of my patients who, she was just gifted. She could make, like, shoe leather tasty. It was just phenomenal, the gift she had when it came to cooking. And um, I was bragging about her to another patient who was in the lobby here, and sure enough, th they started talking. Well, that just, she did what I was trying to do for, for a month, lift this woman's spirits uh, to help, uh, just to be able to help her with her husband. Her speaking with my other patient is what did it. Because she had the things she needed from this other patient to, to, to help. All of a sudden she felt like she was making a difference and things, things were better. It worked. So people um, basically throwing out what works for them is part of it. So when we gather as a group, that, that community, if you will, uh, mindset helps quite a bit. So with our programs, our, our four, six, and 12 month programs all start out the same. Four months, six months, and 12 months. And uh, so we meet together with at least a certain number of people at the same time. And there's a huge impact um, beyond just the treatments. It's not, this is such a, a challenging scenario. It's not a doctor-patient relationship anymore. It's a community effort. And by having people working together as groups, and the four month um, is really just prevention. And so many of these people don't even have any cognitive problems, but they get to see with the six month, which is mild cognitive impairment, and cognitive impairment is the 12 month, the full blown Alzheimer's dementia. They get to see how it works. And that helps with prevention uh, quite a bit as well. So I'm just gonna briefly show you, this is what it actually looks like. Uh, I don't like this picture because the patient's asleep, but the, it looks like they're not doing so hot, but they are. Um, so it's a machine that, that we hook you up to, and it's in the back there, and it, like I said, it measures your endothelial lines, so we can start to see if there's dysfunction already. And through COVID, we've seen just a um, huge surplus with the vaccines and COVID as far as damage to the endothelial lining. And so one of the tests, I'm just gonna mention, if your fibrinogen is high, then that's another sign that something is in the vascular system. And this is a prediction, I'm throwing this out here. I predict post-COVID era, we're going to see an even larger spike with Alzheimer's dementia because of the injury and damage that's occurring currently. We measure fibrinogen with all of our patients, we have for the last 15 years as our standard panel. And we have seen, we went from one in 20, having an abnormal fibrinogen, to the exact opposite where one in 20 is normal over the last two years. So we're actively, we're gonna be publishing that uh, information in the next year because we have a large data set of, of that because it's been our baseline uh, in functional medicine for the last 15 years. So we'll be getting that information out as well. But um, we just changed our, our current protocol because of the amount of fibrinogen to, uh, elevated fibrinogen to those people getting the endopath. So we know that the endothelial dysfunction and the damage there will eventually affect the brain too. It affects the heart first, that's why you're seeing a lot of the heart issues. And I can't remember who it was that we were speaking, oh yeah, we were speaking earlier about the, that very particular scenario, and that's, we're, we see it every day right now, so. So this is a very good, unique way to measure that process. The Hocket is a, is a 10 in one, so we use ozone therapy, uh, PEMF therapy, exercise and oxygen therapy, ultrasonic habitation, far infrared sauna, carbon dioxide therapy, electrotherapy, whole body hyperthermia, it's another sauna, yeah, so a steam sauna as well, photon light therapy, and uh, we may or may not use the aromatherapy, but this helps the immune, it bursts, uh, increases the immune system response, and it helps them detoxify through the skin as well, and it's a very effective uh, treatment. Uh, you'll see this in cancer centers and med spas, uh, but we're using it for the detox, especially for the toxic uh, 
um, group that we see, glycotoxic and toxic. It looks like a little spaceship, so before you go, you're, you're more than welcome to go through and look at that and do a little quick uh, tour, but it just looks like a little spaceship that you sit in there, and that's oxygen that she's breathing in, it's not a microphone um, right there. So the whole body is immersed. Do not put your head in there because that would not be good. <laughs> Uh, and then the M uh, programs, the M-Sculpt, M-Tone, uh, you don't necessarily need to look like this, <laughs> but uh, what this does is it contracts the muscles. So we have the chair, the m cella. so for pelvic incontinence, what's the number one thing that actually disrupts sleep with the elderly? Getting up to the bathroom. Getting up to go to the bathroom, that's right. So by fixing incontinence, by improving, so this has been shown, by, uh, it's FDA approved to increase the pelvic floor by 23%. 23% increase in muscle growth is huge and enough to actually offset the need for uh, getting up when it's a pelvic weakness. Again, women, after you've had a baby, you're more prone to this regardless of age. We have uh, people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s that also need help with that. But improving the pelvic floor and then the area of the brain that delivers blood flow to the rest of the brain is very much uh, impacted by our muscle feedback. Remember I talked about how when we move and exercise? So this machine does the exercise for them. So this one, 30 minutes is equivalent to 11,000 Kegels. Women, did you hear that? 11,000 Kegels. It also pulses, so you're not sore afterwards. So it's not like doing 11,000 bicep curls and it's exhausted. This is equivalent to 20,000 crunches. So it contracts the muscle over and over. The main thing is we're actually contracting the muscle to stimulate the brain. So this helps with the detox process. It helps with the cerebellum's delivery of blood to the brain. Why is that important? If we're pumping it full of nutrients and oxygen delivering mechanisms, you're now increasing oxygen to the brain. So again, exercise will do this as well. But most people who come in with dementia or Alzheimer's are not this. Right. So, and, and you're not going to end up with this either, I'm just going to say that. It will burn fat, so you'll see uh, increasing the, uh, builds the muscle and burns the fat. So it's FDA approved for that. So we know exactly how much it's going to burn and the muscle is going to build. But when you get your core strong, again, what happens? A lot of good things. It feeds back to the cerebellum, the area of the brain, it helps with the brainstem and everything else helps reduce back pain and it helps improve digestive function. When people lose their core, constipation is one of the things that comes from that. So by improving their bowels, improving their sleep, this is like giving artificial um, exercise, if you will, without anything invasive. So it's one of our tools that we just added this last year and um, even with our, I'll give you an example, we had one patient who had uh, more of an ulcerative colitis type of thing and had um, diarrhea. Well, after getting the session, it helped actually with their bowel movements. The bowel was more, more formed. Another person with constipation, it helped with the constipation because they actually had the contraction. Um, this is basically the cost, so people know that ahead of time. And I want to go through this because this is important. For a four-month program, um, you're basically looking at 4,000, uh, 4,600 plus lab work, six months, 73, and 12 months is 12,500 plus labs. The labs generally for this one, for the full Alzheimer's, at a minimum, our baseline lab is $2,700. You may have to do that twice. We've never had to do that yet, but it's still three to $4,000. I want you to look at those numbers. This is the cost for someone uh, for the 12 month program. Now. When you compare it to the cost in Washington, D.C., it's one month when they have Alzheimer's. So when you compare it that way, you're like, okay, it's a good deal. When you compare it to taking it out of your own pocket, different story, right? So this is why it's important to uh, get on top of things early, number one. Number two, it's also why we started our nonprofit organization to help pay for this scenario. Eventually, the nonprofit, when it's fully funded, will pay for everyone's when we do our programs. We're not there yet. So anyone here or looking online, if you have any connections to help the nonprofit, let us know. We'd love to, to, to fund it. Having said that, we have multiple people already established to go through that program because, um, because they have the funding.
wants to do that. So uh, it's important to know that if uh, anyone has any questions on that, who's here, Julie can answer those in the back and I'll show um, people, take people on a tour and answer some questions. This is an example of how the program is broken down just for people so they can look at it. I'll leave it up there for the video so you can go back at it and look at it. And so there are discounts and stuff that are, are put into it, but this gives you an average of what we're looking at uh, over the year. So it's about a thousand dollars a month, a little over a thousand dollars a month, which actually in healthcare is cheap, um, to be quite frank. All right. Um, with that, I want to give you guys all a big round of applause for staying awake because that's a lot of information very quickly, and some of it can be very dry. But uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can go to officialsynapse.com website. There's a lot of uh, our media, we put a lot of our updates there, and um, we will be um, putting this video up there as well. So always look for content there, uh, a lot of information. If you're interested in any of the programs, um, also how to get started in those programs is online. And uh, for the live, we're going to be exiting at this point for the live group. Uh, we're going to sit here and answer questions, or I'll take some questions, answer them, and then we can get up and walk, right? All right, thank you all for coming. I appreciate it very much.